Welcome everyone. I know that we are closing towards the first day of the conference and it's been wonderful. Uh, in fact, it's my third talk in the entire day, so it's been a bit tiring, but I'm super excited to be presenting here at Multi-Tenancy-Con. Um, so our topic is embracing multi-tenancy for scaling MLOps. So we know that we are essentially living in a world of large language models and uh, you, I mean, whether you accept it or not, like we will, every, certain, certainly every major company is looking at adopting machine learning in their use cases, right? And we'll be looking at some of the biggest issues that there currently exist in, in the regular DevOps systems that exist today, right, uh, for most companies and how you can leverage multi-tenancy and some of the other examples that I'll be portraying today uh, with the help of uh, open source tools and that can actually enable uh, your teams uh, to become better at handling large language models or even just more uh, difficult to manage machine learning infrastructure that your traditional DevOps systems cannot handle. So I'm Shavai, I'm a developer relations engineer at Millisearch and my co-speaker who could not come today, uh, Shivanshu, he uh, works at Retrade, but because of visa issues, could not make it up. But uh, I'll be presenting our demo uh, through a recorded video, which uh, he was able to record. So of course, um, just for those folks who might not be aware, because this is a multi-tenancy con and it's not a machine learning uh, conference, we do have the AI day, but just to give a very quick uh, recap of what essentially happens in an end-to-end -end machine learning life cycle. So you start by taking some data and you train it um, and you, of course, then start a training cycle where you take that processed data and try to create certain modern artifacts, model artifacts. And then uh, you first validate whether the performance of the model is good, like whether it's giving you accurate results. And if it does, then of course you push it into production and then it's all about like scaling it similar to how you scale microservices. So of course, all of the different steps that are involved over here, one thing to keep in mind is that ML is not that different than st standard software development. Of course, the end goal is still to be able to scale up your services. And that is why we can use the same or similar multi-tenancy concepts that we usually employ for our standard DevOps systems, but also for MLOps. And we'll see why is that a reason in today's, con in today's talk. Uh, but of course, like once you scale it, you will do a QA. That means you're testing your model with some test data to see whether the model performs well or not. And then you'll deploy it. And of course, then you'll monitor. Like how you'll monitor uh, any traditional service with Prometheus, Grafana, you, you can do that very similarly to monitor the, your model performance. And if it does not work well, then of course, you kind of reiterate and follow some of these different steps uh, inside of your standard machine learning process. Um, but of course, um, one thing to keep into consideration is that uh, data and machine learning infrastructure does not always scale well across teams. Uh, because machine learning is very compute intensive, so there are certain considerations that you have to employ in order to be able to uh, deploy machine learning models efficiently and train especially like large models that we typically see today. As most models are like gigabytes in size. Uh, so that architecture that you will employ for like, let's say running uh, your uh, machine learning models that typically would require you to have GPUs, TPUs might not work well with some other uh, pipelines and it might just actually result in breaking some other team's pipelines if you were doing that because there are some special uh, constraints that you have to put in when dealing with ML infrastructure. And of course, uh, because nowadays we are dealing with a lot of complex models, that means we require dedicated infrastructure teams. Your regular uh, DevOps cannot, or the DevOps pipelines that you're running might not be able to work with these large models that we typically see today. So you need dedicated hardware, specialized set of folks who can handle these large models and training them and then of course deploying them because it requires more com compute, it requires most, more cost, it will take a bit, probably a bit s slower to be able to run these processes. So you need dedicated CPU, GPU memory provisioning, you need multi-tenancy in place so that you can have uh, multiple of these different services running together in a single infrastructure and independent of each other so that, and also of course, you might have to put in dedicated resource allocation 
for different teams because there might be certain ml processes that do not require that much of, that much amount of compute whereas something like training might require a lot of compute so you need to be all, also be able to put cap or dedicated resource allocation for specific ml tasks so of course when we see all these different things as we are kind of expanding there is definitely a need for us to be able to not just use the traditional devops architecture that we usually follow and we need some specialized tooling for that um, and of course uh, the biggest benefit that one can achieve by introducing mlops within or introducing multi tenancy in mlops i think the biggest one is the cost efficiency now generally uh, the if you kind of look at a machine learning company right the data scientists and the ml ops engineers will basically work in silos so the data science team is primarily just involved with training models and going ahead and just deploying the artifacts and they don't they don't care typically about hey like what will this model look like in production right because you need to make certain optimizations to these models before they are pushed into production you cannot have like very large 200 gigabyte sized model or 200 megabyte sized model and just deploy it as it is so typically like the ml ops teams or the devops teams or the infrastructure teams are are kind of in a catch 50 50 like where they are now this i mean they cannot directly just deploy this model that has been given to them by the ml ops by the uh, by the data science team they have to make certain optimizations so there is this uh, distinction that we are making and it's very difficult for them to collaborate together with each other so why not like have uh, cost efficiency by having a single platform where the data science folks and the infrastructure infrastructure teams could actually work together so that would also reduce the complexity and the cost as well to require different stacks or different technologies being used like why not have just one single system where you could actually do or handle all of this at the same time of course that is a direct consequence where you'll also save time because there'll be direct a correlation between the teams that are operating for the data science for like building the models and then of course deploying these models and of course you will also get resource optimization because you are saving up cost by not having to deploy dedicated services on different type of infrastructure whereas you could manage everything through a single platform um and of course the biggest consideration that we want to keep to uh, keep in mind is that um when we are especially deploying these multi tenant ai ml systems we need to ensure that we are able to properly distribute and orchestrate them at the same time right so that is why i would wa want to probably like just introduce the concept of orchestrators over here so of course as i showed in the first slide that machine learning is really all about these different uh, tasks that are essentially happening one after another and of course you're just transforming your data from one format to another so you start off with uh, taking your input raw data then you pre process it to basically remove any errors and then you train it so you get some model artifacts and finally you then you go ahead and deploy that uh, model artifact and use it for making any uh, you know uh, predictions so all of that um so that is like the orchestrator orchestrator is basically a mint picture where essentially orchestrators allow you to coordinate uh, your data flow from one step to another and of course each and every step in this compute is logically uh, you know linked with each other similar to how we have in mlops so of course like any machine learning cycle would fit in very well with a orchestrator and of course um, orchestrators are also very great because they help you to understand that how much uh, units of computation you actually need for each and every step inside of your uh, orchestration so in this case especially for ml we we need this very uh, urgently because of course uh, not every part of the orchestration step will require the same compute and the same cost there will be certain uh, parts of your entire workflow or of the orchestration which might be more heavy and might require more compute right so they give you a lot more data about uh, how you can manage costs and how you can manage the compute and assign it to the dedicated parts of your orchestration and of course you get to know how your data basically flows from one part of the orchestrator to another um what is the type of data because of course uh, whether or not like you're dealing with machine learning data or with uh, non machine learning related workloads uh, you need like strongly typed data as well um and of course like what dependencies will be there that you have to you might have to deal with right and of course like how much resource are you putting into each and every different step of your entire process so that's like something that you have to keep into consideration 
So that is why I like to introduce Flight. So Flight is an open source production grade orchestrator tool. Um, it's similar to Kubeflow if you have heard and the origins of Flight actually started off as Airflow at Lyft. Uh, but they decided that Lyft, like Airflow had certain, uh, you know, uh, I mean, certain issues, especially with machine learning use cases. So Lyft wanted to create an open source product. So it's essentially Flight was, was born out of uh, Air Flight, uh, Air Airflow. And uh, that is how Flight was basically born. Um, and it works pretty well with both machine learning and data use cases. Um, so over here, like this is one example where you have your entire like machine learning uh, code and you basically uh, define tasks and workflows. And I'll come back to that in a bit. But essentially, you're defining these tasks and workflows and these workflows are again, logically categorized in a sequence. Um, you can orchestrate these uh, workflows as much as you want because Flight is basically built as a Kubernetes native platform. So that means you can very easily scale up any part of Flight very easily as you want. So of course, if there are certain workflows, uh, perhaps for training, with where you might want more resources to be added. So you could very easily just spin up new pods and get a resource, like let's say more GPUs allocated to that particular pod in your Kubernetes cluster and assign it to that workflow for your training, right? So essentially you basically package and register them and uh, essentially what happens is that like these are the simple Python modules that get packaged in uh, images and then you uh, deploy them to let's say an S3 bucket and then you can just run them, right? Um, and of course they are executing inside of your container and in your pods. So it's very efficient in terms of being able to scale it up because it's based on Kubernetes. Now, of course, a task is kind of the smallest building block of, uh, you know, of flight. So think of task as like something like if you consider a very simple machine learning example. So you could have one task for just your fetching your data set. So let's say your data set exists on a remote S3 bucket and you want to fetch that remote data set. So there will be just one task that fetches your data. There could be another task that just does some pre-processing of your data. There could be a task that does just the training of your data. So it's a, this, uh, the smallest atomic unit of work. Now, what are workflows? Workflows are essentially logical grouping of your tasks. Um, one or more tasks can be there inside of a single workflow. So you could have like one, one workflow um, that is probably probably being governed by uh, like let's say the um, the data science team. So for them, a workflow could have multiple tasks. So fetching the data, pre-processing the data, and training the data. Whereas there could be a separate workflow that is just uh, specific for the infra team for deploying the model. So you essentially logically group together these different tasks into these workflows. And the great thing about uh, Flight is that you can now scale up these workflows as you want. So here is an example where you kind of define, you know, the first task where we are just taking a pandas data frame and we are doing a multiplier on top of it. Uh, then we have another task that is to find the total spend. And then the workflow uh, is basically logically grouping uh, these uh, tasks together, right? And we'll be seeing in the demo right now with a proper machine learning use case, how this basically works. Uh, of course, and the biggest point now comes to point that how does flight basically embrace multi-tenancy, right? So flight has this concept of projects and domains. So projects are essentially um, logical grouping of uh, different workflows that exist, uh, you know, independently of each other. So let's say uh, if you wanted to have two separate teams in this in this particular platform, so it would basically be, uh, you know, your data science team that's mainly working on the model training, and you have the MLOps team that is working on just the model deployment. So they could work individually in silos and not have to worry too much about you know, like they could basically work in isolation. That is one of the biggest points in uh, in multi-tenancy. So you're, you're getting these logical uh, groupings and built-in isolation that you get with these uh, with the products. And then domains allow you to basically just uh, run your models in any environment. So it could be in development, staging, and production. You get proper uh, Im immunity and uh, proper isolation for these as well. Um, and now like, let's uh, take a look at a demo. So uh, let's quickly take a look over here. Thank you, Shivai. Hi, everyone. This is Shivai Shu. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. Let's get started with the demo. So let's see how resource sharing would work in a multi-tenant setup. 
so for example, in a multi-instance setup, there is no uh, task sharing, no data sharing. But if we introduce a task or task editor, then we can probably share the result of different tasks. We can share the tasks. We can share the database used by different teams. So under the hood, we need an architecture which is which is extensible, meaning we can run different type of uh, ML uh, programs. They might be using different libraries, PyTorch or TensorFlow. So it should be extensible, and there should be a reliable retry mechanism and a worker pool to re-execute the tasks which are getting failed. So this is how uh, the architecture of flight looks like. But uh, we, we probably don't want to dive a bit deep into it. So let's see how resource sharing would work in a in a setup where we are trying to enforce multi-tenancy, uh, where we are running uh, multiple M ML models. So let's say team A is running a workflow uh, where there are different tasks, and then team B, they are also running some workflows, um, and they are sharing the same cluster. And there could be a case that they are running multiple workflows, and then they need to define a project, and then there are again um, resource sharing between the same cluster. So uh, let's see how we can do that with the help of flight. Um, so let me first just uh, show you what is the workflow for team A. So in team A, I have defined a task, this is a simple get data task, and then process the data, and then train the model, and the workflow is uh, doing everything sequentially. Similarly for team B, it's a similar type kind of thing. They have the get data thing, uh, process data task, and train model task, and then the workflow is doing everything sequentially. If I uh, want to run everything in a single cluster and uh, kind of uh, isolate the different teams, the work of different teams, I can create two projects. So for team one, I am creating uh, team A, I am creating the project team A demo. And for second team, let's also create a project for them. And let's register the individual workflows to associated teams. So team A workflow would go to team A uh, project and team B workflow would go to team B project. We can see the registration is successful. So if I go to the UI, I would be able to see uh, demo data science and demo, demo data science and demo team MLOps. Perfect. Now, what I want to do is I want to run uh, the individual workflow. So for team A, I want to run my workflow. I want to run all of my tasks. I can just do uh, my flight run and then the execution would be available. So team A belongs to demo team MLOps. Uh, sorry, team B belongs to demo team MLOps and team A belongs to demo data science. So we need to go to demo data science and development and see if the workflow is launched. So there's a workflow which is registered and it is running and the get data is succeeded, process data is succeeded and train model is running. So if I take a look into what get data is doing, so, get, <clears throat> so in the get data, there is uh, no input because it's just fetching the data. But after getting the data, it is dumping the output in S3 bucket. Similarly, in process data, there is an input from get data, which is using the same S3 bucket, and it is it is dumping the output to another S3 bucket. And now my trained data model will be using that S3 bucket. So this is how all the tasks are linked. And um, if I want, so if another team wants to share the output of, let's say, the task two, they can do so by referencing to this S3 bucket directly, or they can reference the task. Uh, we'll sh I will show you that uh, uh, demo in, in the demo. So this is how the flow looks looks like. Uh, first, we start the workflow, uh, the first task and the second third task and the third task runs in a sequential manner. Similarly for, uh, similarly for data uh, for the second team, that is team MLOps, I can run a similar command and I would be able to see for demo team data science, sorry, team data MLOps, similar workflow, which is again running, get data is running, process data is running, and train data is in waiting state because process data is running. So this is like the simple workflow where uh, every team is uh, 
executing independently in a same cluster under different projects and different workflows. If I want to do task sharing, meaning whatever team A is doing, I want to reuse the results. So as a team B, if the task A is successfully run, I want to use the task A itself. So this is how I can do task sharing. Um, and um, to actually do that, what I need to do is define a, a separate workflow. So let's say I want to use the task, get data task from team A, which we just run uh, demo data science. So we need to go to, so okay, for the ML ops, all the tasks are complete. So we'd go to team A again. Team A is the demo data science data science and we would again see uh, the execution of the workflow and we okay so I want to reuse the get data to replicate this scenario I want to use the get data task for the another project for another team so I want so what I can do is I can reference that task from from team a essentially like this team a demo development team a get data and i need to define the version which is this version so that i can exactly reuse the task a and okay let's try to run that register the workflow okay it's successfully registered and then run the workflow Okay, so if I now go to team B, which is MLOps, and this is the latest run. And if we look at the execution of the workflow, there is one task, though this is team B. So this is team B, but the task, it is using the team A's task. Basically, we have referenced, if I go back to the code, since we have referenced the task from team A, we, we can just reuse the data. We can use everything, the task and the inputs and the outputs. In that sense, it's kind of orchestrating task between different teams and it is giving us a resource optimization. So another use case is how we would uh, create resource isolation, uh, restricted access, uh, restricted, restricted access uh, between different teams as uh, by uh, creating some RBAC rules, Kubernetes RBAC rules. So if I would show, how would I do that? Okay, so before we dive into that, let me see what kind of pods are created. So for every task that I've run, there is a individual pod created, which is now complete. So if I describe a pod, I can see that um, a lot of information is attached. The domain is attached, execution ID, project name, and the name space itself, it contains the project name and in the branch, development staging, basically the domain. So we can use this information to actually create the Arbic rules and the rule bindings, uh, rules and rule bindings. So for team A, I can define the name space uh, and I can create the required role and the corresponding role binding would be the user from team A can only access the uh, pods available in the same namespace. And similarly for team B, I can uh, do only the users in the same namespace can access the resources of the same namespace. Meaning, with the help of namespace isolation uh, and providing and by providing RBAC rules, I can create a resource isolation between different teams. The third thing Fourth thing that we want to see is how GPU and CPU requirements can be satisfied uh, for different tasks. So, for example, and then MNIST uh, training example, um, in get dataset task, I don't need a GPU, but while training, I probably need a GPU. So I can individual task, I can enable and disable GPUs and CPU as well. I can also define how much GPU and CPU I, is required for that particular task. specific resource uh, allocation for individual resources. So essentially, again, being able to define uh, how much specific workloads require specific amount of compute and memory. So that uh, ephemeral storage and what type of, uh, you know, 
runtime you want to use. A CPU or GPU can be defined for individual tasks. And again, specifically for individual teams, that's with the help of the projects, so that you get native multi-tenancy out of the box for these machine learning systems. Uh, but with that, I'll you, basically go ahead and conclude my talk. Uh, so mainly the point over here was to demonstrate that how you can use multi-tenancy and how uh, Essentially, you don't need your uh, DevOps teams and your data science teams to work in different, like, you know, different infrastructure or use different tools. All of them can work on this one single same tool and still have uh, this proper infrastructure in place and uh, resource sharing that can be very efficiently managed with the help of uh, something like an orchestrator tool like Kubeflow or Flight. Uh, so you can uh, feel free to uh, scan this QR code to uh, share any feedback and you can connect with us on Twitter as well. We have shared our handles. Thank you so much.